I'm going to talk now just briefly about expressive methods in COVID-19. And, and, and the headline message, of course, um, it's always good to have a headline, is that expressive methods have flourished in COVID-19. And it's important, we thought, to put them on the programme today because we want to focus on, on methods that do well and that fit with COVID-19 conditions, not just methods that need to be um, stretched or adapted or, or fixed in some way to suit the new challenging circumstances. So expressive has really flushed and, and flushed, flourished. And what do we mean by expressive and why have they done well? And what's the evidence for them um, flourishing during COVID and what's the potential? That's just what I'm going to take you through briefly now. Um, so if we start with the why question, and you might even want to do this in chat, I don't mind if you do it or whether it's a rhetorical question, but there is a, a yes button in the chat. But I, I want to throw out there who here started a diary in lockdown. When I speak to my colleagues, so many of them did. And it was just that need to write down. I did it myself. I only did one entry, <laughs> but a need to write down, my goodness, what's happening to this to us? I've got to write something down about this. So, so many people have been seeking to, to capture, to communicate, to deal with in some way um, what's happening to us. And, and just think back to March 2020, it was just so shocking initially, wasn't it? It was sci-fi. Um, and then the fear, the reality, the horror, the bereavements. And I think this, this is why <laughs> expressive methods ha have flourished because we've had this need to write it down, to draw it, to, to blog it, to, to say it in some way. Um, and in terms of what I mean by expressive methods, I'm really talking about a broad group of methods here. And with arts-based and creative approaches, these are part of this qualitative trend towards expressive techniques in research that can um, kind of present the human condition, the human social phenomena. Um, but there's three kind of key characteristics, I think, that are important to us in these um, COVID times, that these expressive ma uh, methods magnify rather than call down the intensity of the affective experience. So these are methods that, that don't try to dismiss the emotion of it all, that, that, that just try to, 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 to move with that emotion and really understand it and, and um, work with it. They're methods that present vividly and evocatively. And it's interesting, the present presentations we've had so far have been so vivid and evocative. It's almost like the researchers presenting today are using their own expressive methods to capture what they've been through in their research projects. And expressive methods as well, if you look at the literature, there's lots written about how they um, are suited to addressing vulnerability, generating sensitive data, fostering empathy. And these are things we desperately need um, in our research at the moment. So if I just give you a bit of a feel for the expressive methods in the pandemic that we've been finding, and just to recap again, we've been looking at doing a rapid evidence review. So looking at the published literature, looking at the gray literature and talking with the research community in our workshops. Um, and we found some really um, interesting examples of expressive methods being used. And one of the kind of big hitters in terms of the published literature has come from the massive and microscopic sense-making um, during times of COVID-19 project. And the papers from this uh, are all published in a, a special issue of qualitative inquiry 
but what started as a something quite small of researchers saying to the research community, can we do some autoethnography around um, research and life in COVID times? And for 21 days, we're going to send you a prompt and you can express yourself in response to this prompt with a photograph or a poem or some writing. This, this whole thing just um, grew and grew and grew. <laughs> and in the editorial, the, the, the um, guest, uh, guest issue editors talk about 150 people from 26 countries responding at that time to, to the prompts. Um, and so we see this, um, and going back to things in the chat, privileged research community who are able to kind of engage with autoethnography, um, doing so through these um, very expressive methods, lots of collaborative ethnographies and creative ethnographies. But we've also seen in the published literature um, interesting um, papers about rural farmers in Zimbabwe, Indonesia, Mozambique, sharing their experiences of, you know, food production <laughs> in times of crisis. But they have been sharing them through um, apps on phones, through diary methods, through focus groups, all sorts of methods but part of their motivation to share, because these aren't a community that are used to engaging with research, is that um, they, the desire to express, they can express. We've had examples of migrant children from three African countries using digital audio traditional diaries to explore their everyday lives. We've had young people in different countries, again, doing video diaries, but also voice notes, embroidery, journaling, young people doing digital storytelling, um, sharing photographs. And I, I noted in the chat some of the, but what about the not digital? <laughs> and one of the fascinating papers we wrote, uh, we wrote, I wish we'd written it, we read was about um, the onlineification of everything and the alternatives to the onlineification of everything. And some of these methods were much more low tech expressions, crafting, story completion methods. And, you know, draw, I'd want to draw your attention to the mass observation archive, which, um, you know, apparently have just had masses and masses of entries where people want to express their feelings, their experiences of what's going on in these extraordinary months. So if we just stop for a moment and think about the potential and go back to why expressive methods at the moment, what these methods and these studies that are coming to our attention in the project have in common is this desire for sense making and sometimes collaborative sense making. Um, I think it's part of this human condition to try to make sense of what's going on. Um, and these methods are, are supportive of that. But these methods also build and maintain relationships between research participants, between participants and researchers and between communities where all of those boundaries are blurred because they do get blurred. Um, they also have in common, I think, a lot of the studies that we've read using these expressive methods, a desire to take care of participants, um, a concern with their well-being and ethic of care. And I think that was evident in, in Poppy's work that she talked about. But the interesting bit, I think, that we might come back to in the questions is that they are generating overwhelming qual quantities of data. <laughs> so one of our questions is, what do we do with all of this data as we move on? 